Good afternoon and welcome back to My Harlem Portraits, the show that aims at shedding the light on the fundamental contribution of African Americans to the building of this country and on Black excellence. To represent in the utmost way Black excellence, we have a very exceptional guest today. He is a real modern Renaissance man. He is a former president of Verizon, is a media mogul, founder of Solidify Productions, film and broader producer, author, and philanthropist. Welcome to My Harlem Portraits, Mr. B.K. Fulton. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. I am so happy you could make it because I found a lot of difficulties in putting together this interview because I didn't know where to start. I mean, you are doing everything. So I'm like, where do I start? <laughs> so I'm trying to go in order, but if you want, you can, you know, fly away. Okay, I'm sure we'll figure it out. All right, so let's start with your uh, experience as president of Verizon and uh, what prompted you since you retired in 2015 to become a full-time mogul? Sure. So Verizon was really good to me. Uh, I'm a technologist by nature and also by training. I went to Virginia Tech for engineering and architecture, ended up going to Harvard and the New School was a Sloan Fellow and studied management science. And then I got a Juris Doctorate or Law Degree in Intellectual Property and Telecommunications and Electronic Commerce. And so it seemed like Verizon was a natural. I actually worked at a few media companies, America Online, Time Warner, and ultimately Verizon before I retired. And uh, spent a lot of time doing strategy early on. Then I went and ran the West Virginia business and the Virginia business and took the Mid-Atlantic region, which was Washington, D.C., Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. And I had about 45,000 employees at the height of my career. Only? Only. And then responsible <laughs> for what looked like about $6.5 billion in revenue. Wow. So it was a great experience. It taught me a lot. But I also got to meet a lot of really great people and um, got inspired by their stories. And then also when I was an engineering student at uh, Virginia Tech, my first few years, it was too many beautiful people like yourself, uh, too much sports and basketball. And so I probably wasn't the best student. And um, I went to the library to plan my escape. And I ended up in the E-185 section. And in any Dewey Decimal System in the world, the E-185 system, the E-185 section is the section on Black people. And there was all this history that I didn't know. So out of two million volumes and five stories of building, I found the, this book on a guy named Lewis Latimer, who's from, whose family is from Virginia, where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And he um, invented the part of the light bulb that glowed. And I was like, oh my main God. One, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's how the main I, part. <laughs> how could I not know this? Um, I then picked up another book about a guy named Granville T. Wood, who invented the electric third rail and, and the first roller coaster. And it's all this amazing stuff, also happened to be African American. And so I was like, wait a minute, I haven't been given all the facts and the stories. We come from a shared narrative of allies and excellence. And people all over the world have contributed. Even our Latino brothers invented color TV. How many people know that? Mr. Camarena in the 1940s invented color television. And we do not know. No. I and so instead, we often, when minorities and women get to tell their stories, they're often through this prism of sorrows. And we're telling the pain of our experiences. And while every story has a right to be told, it is crucial that young people understand what we can do, what we have done, what we're capable of. We need to normalize excellence because we are excellent by design. And so for me, I went down this path where I got to meet people like Muhammad Ali and other leaders. I became a leader. And at the end of the day, what I do now is a thank you to those people who went before us. We stand on the shoulders of giants but not to be seen so we can see the way forward for those who will follow. Uh, and I, I do this work 
as a thank you to them, but I also do it because I know what it did for me. When I was reading those books, I went from the probations list to the dean's list to the board of directors of my college where they're flying me in a jet to govern the school. Wow. Not because I was a different person, but because I had different information and it made me believe differently about myself. And I walked into my power and everyone has it, everyone. And when you are the best of who you can be and I'm the best of who I can be and our listeners and others bring the best of what they can be, the world gets better because we come up with solutions, we solve things, we operate out of love. And that's what I want. It's important for all of us to realize the power of love. Wow. We couldn't hope in a better introduction to Black History Month than this one. This is gonna be the first show for Black History Month. So Beautiful. wonderful. Thank you so much. And mi corazón de Latino. Muchas gracias. Mi <laughs> corazón de Italiana. <laughs> uh, you have produced more than 20 films, 16 books, and three number one Broadway shows, including Thoughts of a Color Man, that I saw, wonderful, and The Piano Lesson, which I also saw, with Samuel L. Jackson, John David Washington, and... Uh, Daniel Brooks. Daniel yeah. Brooks. Yeah. And that was nominated for two Tonys and remains the highest grossing Broadway revival of all time. Tell me a little bit about how did you get into that? Wow. Well, some of the producers that were on Thoughts of the Colored Man uh, did, did uh, the piano lesson and they reached out to this cohort of investors and I was one of them. And so I decided to jump in that as well. Uh, we also are part of the Out Outsiders, which is uh, a, a revival. But at the end of the day, um, you know, this community is a tight one. And when people see the success and, um, and you've got a good team together, that team picks up other projects. And it happens in the movies. You know, Steven Spielberg works with the core group of people and tends to be his same cinematographer and that sort of thing. And so the same thing happens in Broadway and in film. And so you find this reliable team, people with integrity, people with good artistic vision, and then you kind of pull that together. And then with uh, the piano lesson, when you take um, the beautiful work, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning work of an August Wilson, who's Broadway royalty, and you take great actors like Danielle and John David and Sam, it's hard not to do good. We didn't know it was gonna do that good, but the show was fantastic. Uh, opening night was electric. And um, and now we find ourselves having the same uh, success with The Wiz. So that'll open, I think opening night is April 17th. And we have um, Wayne Brady as The Wiz, Deborah Cox, um, Nichelle Lewis playing Dorothy. And she's a young talent out of uh, Richmond, Virginia, where I currently live. And she's just really doing a great job. But that ensemble, then the story of The Wiz, many friends tell me that, the very first play they ever saw was The Wiz back when it was out some time ago. Yeah. And so they want to take their daughters or grandchildren or go back and kind of relive some of the nostalgia of it. I mean, and, and, and now that we're out of COVID, being able to go back to uh, theater or Broadway shows and get out and about is really important. And I think it's, 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 it's critical to interact and to hear the audience and to laugh with an audience, to be out with someone you care about. It, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So it's really an honor for me to be a part of it. And I hope we get to do many more. I'm sure you're going to do that. And you are preempted my next question, which was this one, the 2024 Broadway revival of both The Wiz and The Outsiders. And The Wiz, when he first showed on Broadway, George Faison, won a Tony for the first time a black man won a Tony for choreography on Broadway. How about that? George Faison is one of the first people that I interviewed on this show. Fantastic, I'm honored. It's, it's fantastic. So uh, tell us about uh, this uh, musical that you recently wrote, co-wrote, which is the one you were talking about before, based on the true story about August Wilson's life, which is titled From August with Love. Sure. So, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I had not known about this story. A business partner uh, was sharing her backstory, and it turned out that uh, her mom said, hey, I have these letters from Augie. And her daughter was like, letters from who? She was like, Augie. And her daughter's like, oh, what are you talking about? And so the mom went and got them, and there were these original handwritten letters signed from August with love, and it turns out it's August Wilson. And so he was a he was a young person, hadn't written plays yet. And because he started out as a poet and uh, he, would, he would go to her diner. He didn't always have money. And so sometimes she would take care of the bill and uh, he would sign the, the, the receipts from August with love, write her a little poem on the back. They became very close. And actually, um, we believe that her daughter is his daughter as well. Wow. Uh, the, the business partner doesn't know who her dad is and she looks a lot like August Wilson uh -huh. and and um, and so that remains to be seen but be that as it may uh, I collaborated with a, a, a Broadway player and we wrote this wonderful script and musical so there are about 15 songs and a two-act play that tells the story of this wonderful woman who looked out for August and then um, his emergence as a theatrical Broadway icon. And so yeah. it's a beautiful little story. Fantastic. And uh, you gave us the scoop. Yes, you have the scoop. Is maybe you know, go there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you something that you probably don't, well, you may, you may know, you may not, but because you know, this is a, a is, is Harlem centric. So I used to live in Harlem. Oh. And part of my Sloan Fellowship was a scholarship to the new school. Mm -hmm. I lived in Harlem, but I did my master's thesis on Harlem and community redevelopment. And I did it with the Abyssinian Development Corporation. Yes. Harlem Urban Development Corporation adopted it. It was called Ghetto No More. And it became the master plan for Central Harlem. So a lot of that work from 114th up past 135th Street, I wrote it when I was in New York and graduate school. My very first house was a condo on 116th Street between St. Nick and Lenox. That's what and I think. There you go. I live on 116 between 5th and Lenox. How about that? How about that? So 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 that so that development, the hotel, the path mark, uh the 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 giving indigenous residents of Harlem an opportunity to own. That's my work from graduate school. That is incredible. What time, what year was that? It was in the nineties. Yeah. Wow. yeah. That was early time. So you did, you were force really foreseeing what was going to happen in Harlem. Yeah. yeah it, it was, remember. sorry. No, it, it was a beautiful time. I had this scholarship and I was coming from the country in Virginia, going to the big city, didn't know what to expect. And when I got there, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with Harlem. I mean, I lived in Brooklyn initially, then moved to Harlem the, you know, the first year of school and never left. And so bought a house there, lived there for a few years. We adopted some children um, while we were living in New York and then made our way back home to Virginia. Wow, that is a beautiful story. Thank you. Harlem is, Harlem has an energy that just takes you in because there is so much culture here. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm doing this show, to give back to Harlem, who embraced me like a family. I love it. I love it. I feel more at home here than I feel in Italy. So. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. I love Italy too. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's beautiful, but the energy here is what I need. Yes, yes. I need the music, I need the arts, I need the theater, and mm -hmm. I don't think there is any other place in the yeah. world like New York City and Harlem to have this kind of stuff. Oh, I think that's after, I would agree with that. Yeah, it's 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 special. Yeah, very special. Okay, so the uh, let's talk about Solidify which you founded with your powerhouse wife, I would say, because what you sent me, I'm going to, I would like to interview her too, because okay. she's really amazing. Okay. Yes. Yes. Jackie Stone. 
and Soul Vision TV ma and magazine and your two latest films, Freedom, Freedom's Path, which is an historical war drama and The Kill Room, which is featuring Yuma Turner, Samuel L. Jackson and Joy Manganiello, which was received at the Venice Film Festival, right? Yes, uh, yes, it, it, it was. And uh, there was a bidding war over the film, actually at the Cannes Film Festival, and um, very well received. So we ended up releasing that film in September, and then it went on streaming stuff. Now it's available on uh, pretty much every platform. Uh, friends, when they see it, because I, I still live in Virginia, so they think, you know, when you see big movies, they think Hollywood or New York. And so they say, like, BK, I saw your name on the screen in the airplane watching The Kill Room. And I was like, yeah, that's my movie. And I'm like, yeah, but you say it's a nonchalant. I was like, well, I, mean, I, I got more, you know? And so it, it's really fun, but it's it's fun to be in this creative space and to put out these things that the world can see. And so so, so part of my strategy here is, um, you know, they say each one teach one. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea of it, but if each one teaches one, it's not really growth. When this one goes, you just have one that remains. So the net plus is 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 just one, you know, not even one. If you have one, have one, this one goes away, you still got one. But if each one teaches as many as you can, then all of a sudden, if one goes, you still got a bunch. Yeah. And so the way to reach many is through media, TV, movies, um, Broadway to an extent. And so for me, medium was one of the most powerful tools that human beings had created and color media, thanks to Mr. Camarena. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that if I could put these great stories into the cinema, into on the stage, I could really help people to maybe think differently about how they interact with others, how they treat themselves, how they reach for their goals. Because if a guy from Virginia can do it, anyone can do it. My parents were teachers. I didn't come from a big, uh, you know, rich family. I came from a family that was rich in love, mm -hmm. that was rich in kindness, that was rich in integrity. Both my parents were school teachers. And I cut grass from when I was 10 years old. So I've been working all my life. And so you learn these values that work. And then you go and work those values and it gives you an opportunity to have a life. I mean, my office here is messy, but you can see from the wall, I collect a lot of art. That uh, medal back there is a Smithsonian Laureate's medal. I won that in, two, in 2000 uh, for my work to connect communities worldwide with technology. And so my papers and writings will be permanently archived at the Smithsonian. But you know what, Maria? I've never gone to see the exhibit. It's at the Smithsonian because I feel like I'm too young and I'm not done yet. I'll go see it when I'm actually old. Right now, I just got a little gray hair, but I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm excited about my work. I'm retired technically, but I'm probably working more hours than I ever have. But because I love what I'm doing, it doesn't feel like work. So Making Freedom's Path was this movie about friendship, faith, and freedom. And it's these two guys, one white guy, one black guy, and they kind of come together as friends in the antebellum South. And part of the story there is, if these guys can be friendly in 1863, we can be like brothers and friendly in 2023, 2024, 3033, we can figure it out. And then The Kill Room was a fun kind of art world meets the underworld movie. It's the first time Sam and Uma have been together since Pulp Fiction. And the very first time they've been in, on the same screen at the same time. Mm -hmm. In Pulp Fiction, they were in different scenes. But in my movie, they're actually in the same scenes a few times. So that's never happened before. So we were able to pull that off. And of course, Sam was also in the piano lesson. So one of the things that we now enjoy the benefit of is that we're you know, increasingly bigger budgets and increasingly bigger names and talent to help to tell our stories. So we're, we're, we're honored to be a part of this community. It's fantastic what you say. Thank especially you. Especially in 2024, and especially in this time that I consider in my lifetime to be the worst ever. Yeah. Because... Yeah. Wars, uh, 
lies, uh, violence, uh, mental sickness, everything is coinciding and it's making this so precarious, this, this democracy that we have. All yeah. Right. Yeah, we've got some we've got some work to do. Um, and my wife and I are lawyers. We started this thread talking a little bit about Jackie. So let me brag on her a little bit. Uh, uh, Jackie was the first African American female partner in the history of Virginia, in a in a major law firm. Her dad was the first black judge in the history of Virginia, the Honorable William T. Stone. May he rest in peace. Um, and Jackie went on to bring in many people. She said that I may be the first, but I won't be the last. And mm -hmm. now she has many female partners of all ethnicities working and running offices in major cities. They're one of the they're the biggest law firm in Virginia and one of the top 30 in the world. And um, one of her recruits early in her career, uh, maybe 15, 16 years ago, is now the chairman. And he is the first African-American chairman of a top 30 law firm in the history of the country. Wow. And uh, so that's who my wife is and, and, and much more. Jackie, Harvard Law, UVA. She was also a cheerleader, so she's strikingly gorgeous and super brilliant. And uh, But you wouldn't know that she was a Harvard-trained lawyer if you just met her, other than you could tell she was smart. But what Jackie does is, you know, something needed to be picked up in a restaurant or around the house. She just pitches right in. She helps. <laughs> and so it, it's the kind of person you want to be around. I'm the same way. I, you know, I don't I don't wear that. I was the president and CEO of this big company. I don't wear that. I chair my own media company that we've got all these films and stuff. I just I'm, you know, I'm a guy who works hard and I love people, especially people who are friendly and, um, and I try to make myself available. I think, you know, we should all try to be the change we seek. And, um, and, and the more we show kindness, the more I think we experience it in the main. Um, but what ends up happening in a society where there is so much meanness as you described, and it feels like the worst it's been in a while, that people start to hold on to their treasures, hold on to their time, hold on to the things that they feel like they need to protect and they assume everybody outside of that is, is enemies or people that don't look like them are going to be problematic. And then they start creating weird policies and weird rules. Thank goodness this recent attempt to impeach this guy didn't go because that's just silliness. It's silliness. And you really need grownups minding the store, especially the country, mm -hmm. not people who, who don't have anything better to do than to do nonsense. It, it, it's disappointing. Um, and so the grownups, me, you, the people watching the show, the people who are thinking about running for office, um, maybe it's time. Maybe we have to engage so that we don't turn the world over to people who are still acting like children. Yeah, that is absolutely the truth and the necessity right now. And let's hope that 2024 happens in the right way because yes that that could take us to a civil war i feel that very strongly i'm very i'm very worried about that i i all my life i worked in politics because i worked in the european parliament all my mm -hmm. life so that for me is my other side you know art and politics and civil rights that's what and passions me. So your Mr. Business children's books are being made into a movie. And I like to underline the fact that 10% of the proceed of your first book titled Shona, inspired by your sister's illness, the rat syndrome, which I never heard about before, go to the International Rat Syndrome Foundation. Then also, HBO is making a documentary about your movie Pass 2.0 business venture, which is a subscription app that includes movie theaters across the country. Tell us about all this. <laughs> <I know. laughs> yes, yeah, so, um, so in March, uh, 
uh, at South by Southwest, we'll have the world premiere of Movie Pass, Movie Crash, which uh, is Mark Wahlberg, done by Mark Wahlberg's production company with HBO and Warner Brothers, Dist Warner Brothers Distribution. And so I'll be going out to Texas for that. And that's in, in early uh, March. And um, we're excited about it. I mean, basically, it's about the story of the rise of this innovative company founded by a guy named Stacy Spikes, and then the takeover and, and the crash of the company and the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So the so it talks about us bringing it back. Um, I was one of the lead investors in bringing it back. We've also added another uh, what's called a vertical, another gaming vertical. So it'll be movies and gaming. And um, and we're excited about it. You can it's live now, moviepass.com, and you can subscribe. We have a ten dollar, twenty dollar, and thirty dollar a month subscription. Effectively, if you have our app, you hit movie pass, all the movies in your area pop up, and you pick the one you want to go to, and you go to the movies or IMAX and you watch your movie. It's a wonderful thing. And then it'll be the same for games. And then once we turn on the freemium package, then you don't even have to subscribe. Uh, with a credit card, you can watch ads and it'll pay for your entertainment experience, movies, games, things like that. So wow. we've in invented that and, and the company is based in New York, in fact. Uh, so uh, we're excited about that. Uh, the book Shauna was my first book I wrote right when I retired and um, published in 2015. Nikki Giovanni wrote the cover quote on the back. Oh, that's um, it's based on a poem I wrote when I was 16 years old about my little sister because I was a young kid. I was an athlete and she had all these challenges and I was trying to figure out what was going on. Did I, did something happen to her? Can I help? And so I, it was a, it was a sort of a prayer, I guess, but it goes like this. A gazing little boy stopped and asked, can you run? Yes. Adjusting her leg brace. Can you dance? Yes adjusting her position in her wheelchair. Are you happy? Yes, adjusting her gaze towards heaven. Big brother, now that you are a man, in your newfound wisdom, don't count me out. I run in my mind, I am an Olympian. I dance in my dreams, I am a debutante. And I am happy because I am alive. Wow. And so I wrote that when I was 16, and then and then Jackie, my wife, it convinced me to turn it into a book um, as my first book. So then after that, I wrote 10 more children's books. So Mr. Business, uh, The Adventures of Little BK, so me when I was a third grader and you know, first day of school and when I had to wear glasses and when my dog had a tick on him and secret places <laughs> and all this stuff. So little fun lessons, also a place to journal. We actually partner with the University of Pennsylvania, the number one school, graduate school of education, and they do a free curriculum that we give away for each of the books. Yeah. And we decided to turn it into a movie because it's fun stories, it's lighthearted, it's inter-ethnic, and um, we think it'd be good for kids. There hasn't been a show, a cartoon based on a character of color in a while. And, and the reason that that's important is because um, you know, what you believe is really, is, is really critical in life. And the, the brain science is this, that ch when children identify with the character on the front of a book or inside the pages, they are three to 10 times more likely to believe they can do what the character does. That is the importance of telling our children history and telling them who they are before the world tells them who they are not. Yeah. So instead of all these things just totally about our, our our struggles. We also have to tell about our successes. You have to show young people that they have been engineers, that we have invented things that are important, that we contribute, that we have shows like yours, that we're business people, that we're creatives, that we're leaders. And then it's easier for them to believe that they can do it and they'll get on the path and they'll do the work. But if all they hear is the, the, the sad stories, or your people are trying to cross the border, or your people are trying to get something for nothing, or your people are terrible, then the, then some will believe it. Yeah. And it will slow down. I believed it for a little bit. <laughs> if you are educated in this society, unfortunately, the education is skewed towards the old narratives. Yep. And we've got to freshen it for a new day. And what I try to do is I tell people, look, when, I, when all the groups work together, we achieve at a whole nother level. So this isn't about pushing out any group. It's about embracing 
all of us, all of humanity. Let's look up and see all of the sky, not half of it. Wonderful. My God. <sighs> I'm so happy I'm doing this interview with you. It's giving me new life. <laughs> I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it as well. You are a board member of a National Center of Women's Innovations. And this encourages young girls to, to succeed, especially in STEM fields. Tell us about the connection with Dr. Gladys Brown West, the black mathematician whose mapping of the world enabled GPS. And what sure. you girls. Sure, so, so Dr. West, and she's still alive. She's 93, she'll be 94 in October. Uh, our inaugural event for the National Center of Women's Innovation was to honor her uh, Deborah Roberts flew in from New York to do the uh, keynote, and I was the moderator, and we wanted to create awareness. We're going to build an exhibit that'll be able to travel so we can put it in schools. We're going to work with some leading universities and, and create the largest database of women innovators so that it's readily available. We'll probably do an app to put it on the app as well so it's at people's fingertips. Because again, if you don't know, you don't know. So everybody's probably heard girls aren't good at math. Of course, that's nonsense. To invent GPS, you got to be pretty good at math. Women did that. Rocket fuel. Women did that. That's right. Uh, doorbell systems. A woman did that. Forced air. A woman did that. Computer languages. A woman did that. You know. But if you don't know, you'll believe the nonsense out there. Mm -hmm. And so we'll, we'll take some pressure off some of the scientists who think scientists only come a certain way. And we will highlight the scientists that, that, that somehow managed to break through, but we can help more of them break through. I mean, the, all, these, all these new medical miracles that are happening because of the CRISPR system, very often you'll hear the guys mentioned, but it was a woman who helped to invent yes. CRISPR. Thank you. <laughs> and Thank she's still you. alive. And so, and so at the end of the day, God made us all great and these creatures, beautiful, big and small and different shapes and sizes. But, you know, the, the, the moral of what I'm trying to say and what I try to say with this poem about my little sister is no matter who you are, old or young, rich or poor, white, black, Latino, Asian, Native American, um, you know, whatever your sexual proclivity, it doesn't matter. Whatever your ability, you are on the hook if you have life. And what you do with it is your way of giving back. And so we all are on the hook. If you woke up this morning, you're on the hook. Do something with your life. Very often, the greatest successes in life are found on the same roads we took to avoid them. Yes. So what you have to do is get up, get going. You're going to bump your knee a couple of times, brush it off, you'll heal and keep going. Find your tribe, find people that support what you're doing and they'll help you, you know, and that's the way it works. When you do everything you know how to do, your faith tradition, your, your, your ancestors, everything that is good comes together, conspires, as Paulo, Paulo Coelho would say, conspires for a just end. And I've embraced that, and that has been my lived experience. I mean, it it, it 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 even works down to parking. Wherever I go in the world, I park up front, and I don't. God shouldn't care about my parking, but she does. And so I pull up. It can be rush hour in New York. I say, "Oh, my park will be up up front." No way. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It, it happens to me all the time. I've just gotten used to it, and I'll pull up and right there, you know. No, and it happens to me too. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to me too all the time. Someone is pulling out when I'm coming. It's incredible. Yes, yes. <laughs> that, that's why I tell people to, to we have to normalize excellence because part of the reason I experience so much excellence is because I expect excellence. So I'm looking for excellence. If you're looking for hate, you're going to find it. If you're looking for anger, you're going to find it. If you're looking for somebody to be biased against you or to um, not like you, you can find that too. What I choose to find is the excellence, is the love, is the kindness. And I, I give it and I seek it out and it comes right back to me. It's a beautiful thing. I love living. Fantastic. You and your wife are also philanthropists. 
you are giving to causes that develop and expose expose young entrepreneur and connect them to global uh, leaders around the world. And the fact that with uh, Adam Le Leipzig, you yeah. founded the uh, MediaU.com and you are launching the first online film school with university credits and transcripts. So, so I, I love that question. You know, giving back is important. To whom much is given, much is expected. And so my wife and I have been blessed. And so we give back a lot to many causes, many scholarships, education, focused stuff. We try to teach people what we know. And so we're often mentoring. Uh, Media U is an opportunity to take um, all of the stuff I've learned in the film business. And then Adam has 34 years in the film business. So combined, we're probably over 50 films. And he's up. he's been up for two Academy Awards. Wow. And he also did March of the Penguins, Dead Poet Society, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. So he's a very, very uh, famous uh, producer. And we realized that we could help people to tell more stories using the tools of their time if we had a, a, a film school that was more virtual than bricks and mortar. And so that that's what Media U is. So we're actually working with some major institutions um, around the world to enable their ability to do professional storytelling. And so you should hear announcements pretty soon. I, I can't jinx it, but um, I'm excited about the, the progress. Uh, but giving back is important because at the end of the day, right? None of us come here to stay. Mm -hmm. And so what is the mark that you're leaving on the world? Will it know that you were here? I mean, some of these artists, they, they pour themselves into their work and they might die in poverty, um, but people still know that they're here. You know, yeah. August Wilson isn't with us anymore, but we have his work and we're still inspired by it and moved by it. My work will be the stuff I do in film, the stuff I do in uh, on stage and Broadway, but also the young people we touch and invest in through Media U and other things. And they will go on to do stuff. And even if it's not in the media space, I'm OK with that. Just go out and be the best version of yourself. Because when each person is the best version of yourself and it comes together, it resolves in love. And that's what we need right now. A lot more love. Thank you. I think this is the best way to conclude our interview. We need okay. more love. We definitely do. And you are giving a lot of love. You gave me a lot of love during this conversation. It really, I think love is contagious. Yes, yes. And so when you give love, you receive love. And that's yes. what you're doing. And that's what you're receiving, obviously, yes. in your life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for this amazing, amazing interview and for being the person you are. I'm expecting to have your wife on my show also. I will tell her and uh, <laughs> she will make it happen. Thank you so much. And Thank you to our viewers and see you like every Saturday, 12.30 on Spectrum News and on MNN.org. Bye-bye. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.